Well, the corn was the infant derivative of uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, psychoanalysis itself was formulated by Freud in uh, the 1890s in Vienna. Uh, Lacan was born in Paris in 1901. So by the time he was 20, uh, he, was really, um, he was really the person who took psychoanalysis into its adolescence. Prior to that, uh, psychoanalysis had been very dominated by uh, the American School of Psychoanalysis, which was framed in terms of ego psychology, ego psychology. And much of the assumptions driving that interpretation of Freud uh, derives from, well, Freud gives a lovely picture of uh, the psyche and he uses this analogy of a horse rider, somebody sitting on the back of this horse trying to steer it across the safe ground. And of course the horse, this big sort of mass of flesh beneath his legs sort of speeding along. Uh, the rider is the ego and it's trying to control its desires in the light of the surrounding countryside so it has safe passage. And this is, was taken up by the ego psychologists as really a description of what psychoanalysis should be doing. It should be on the basis of the ego using and building its defences against all these kinds of licentious desires uh, with a view to creating a nice safe passage. And, uh, and you can see that quite practically actually in uh, the uh, uh, American foreign policy, the architect of it being Henry Kissinger, a great reader of Freud, who uh, began to think that uh, all those other sort of warring nation states were uh, desirous and to be controlled through the ego domination of American foreign policy. And of course, this sort of manifests a little bit later on with the Star Wars project, this lovely great sort of ego bubble. But this was really what uh, Lacan was trying to challenge. And he challenged this in a very simple and elegant way. As I said, this was France. This was a sort of crucible of avant-garde, surrealist thinking. We had structuralism, we had various forms of philosophy and phenomenology. Heidegger was being interpreted. And we have all these streams feeding in. We have this important emphasis on language. And what Lacan does is very simple. He basically says everything Freud said was true, but really he was talking about language. So if we take the Oedipal complex, for example, that's not so much a, a biological story about our desires for our mother and our murderous desires towards our father. It's really a story about how we enter language. And of course, this changes the whole dynamic of how we approach psychoanalysis. Because the thing about language, the thing about what makes language meaningful, when we put it within a structuralist context, and this is very important, Lacan is interested in language as a structure. We tend to think of things in terms of feelings and emotions now, but Lacan was interested in nice cold structures. What are the relationships that make think, what are the relationships that make thought think the way it does? And if we're going to say that what makes us as a human being and a subject is language, and what makes meaning in language is really the way that signifiers are organised in relation to each other, then that shifts the whole basis of how we understand the subject. The subject cannot be this simple ego dominating subject that tries to quash all its desires. Now this is uh, most um, succinctly summed up in Lacan's claim that the unconscious is structured like a language. The unconscious is structured like a language. In other words, it's a structure. The unconscious is a structure. Language is a structure. It has grammar and it has rules, etc. When we enter into the analyst's um, you know, the, a clinic, for example, we, we enter into a sort of a, a kind of formal arrangement, an understanding about how people speak, etc. And so there's a kind of structure within there. The unconscious is structured like a language. But it also means, it also means that the unconscious functions in the way that language 
kind of functions. So, as I said, language is both inside and it's outside. And so if we say the unconscious is structured like a language, then actually we can begin to read the unconscious much more confidently in what we say and do. Now, of course, we must take into account that there's a sort of general scepticism about language, which really pervades a lot of postmodern thought. Oh, I can never say what I mean. Words get in the way of the real world, etc., etc. I'm not quite sure where this pessimism came from. But uh, language is really quite amazing because uh, every now and again, we actually say what we mean. You know, language can hit the mark, make the bullseye, so to speak. Uh, you know, the classic example of that, of course, is the Freudian slip. You say one thing and you mean your mother. Uh, at that point, that's the point at which you actually speak the truth. Language can speak the truth. The unconscious is not simply buried away inside us. It's in what we do and what we say. And so rather than simply have psychoanalysis as a place where we can build up the strong defences of the ego against our various desires. The aim is to entertain a conversation. Well, perhaps not even a conversation, but to entertain speech. To speak without censure. And then what's required is a very imminent practice of listening and intervening. Trying to understand exactly what is the significance in what we're saying. So, um, um, one way to describe this uh, imminent practice, um, it's a little bit like uh, the old problematic of where do you hide a murdered body? Well, you hide it in a battlefield. Where do you hide a leaf? You hide it in a forest. Where do you hide a diamond? You hide it in the chandelier. Um, if you're going to hide something, the best place to put it is in full view. And what better full view could you have than in speech? So the unconscious, when the Corn says the unconscious is structured like a language, we can take that as a very empowering uh, statement which can encourage us to think very much about what we are saying and not so much think about um, you know, these sort of repressed desires inside, but actually listen to the way that desire is already operative in what we say and how we speak and what we speak about, etc. So the unconscious is structured like a language. And as I say, this brings back Lacan to the central problematic of the relationship between the analyst and what Lacan called the analysand. The analysand, that's the gerund form of analyst. And it makes it a kind of, uh, it, what it does is it stops if you call somebody a patient. It makes them very passive in the experience. I'm the doctor, you're the patient, I administer to you. And the patient doesn't really do much apart from perhaps take some medication. But uh, in calling them the analysand, he's really trying to say that they have a very active part in this process because it is about speech. Now, this had enormous implications and, and ramifications for the whole practice, and it got the corn into a lot of trouble. Uh, probably one of the most important um, things he introduced was the short session. Psychoanalytic um, sessions tend to be about 50 minutes. I think it was 50 minutes because uh, they thought that um, the analyst should have perhaps 10 minutes to go to the toilet between the patients. It's quite an arbitrary number. But sometimes, sometimes, when we're talking, we can reach a point of conclusion. We can say something very meaningful. And thereafter, anything that we're likely to say in the session is really just sort of, um, uh, you know, just sort of padding out because the significance of what we said may have already been picked up. And often, when you end a session, when you end a psychoanalytic session, you might be inclined to imbue it with meaning anyway, regardless of how long it was. So if it's 50 minutes, you're still going to pick up on the last thing you said as being the meaningful moment. Why did we end there? What was it I said about that moment? And the corn thought that because we're dealing with speech and the unconscious, but we ought to be engaging and we ought to be allowing the analytic session to be governed by the process of speech. So one could easily imagine, for example, somebody coming in uh, and uh, 
uh, talking, for example, uh, discovering, um, let's say, uh, you know, having a little revelatory moment about the way something they've said returns to them in a new light. Uh, and that really, after, you know, as I say, thereafter, it all really becomes just, just sort of extra, extra padding. The Corn's point was, well, let's end it there and use that productively so that they take what we said at that moment. This was seen as very problematic, very problematic. French psychoanalysts at this time in Paris were really trying to gain accreditation by the International Psychoanalytic uh, Association, the IPA. And, um, and this was largely successful, but the IPA were very worried about Lacan and this idea that people were coming into sessions, they were talking, and then regardless of uh, the 50 minutes, some were having short sessions, some were having long sessions. And they thought this was uh, a dangerous abuse of power on the part of the analyst. Uh, and so, actually, the French psychoanalysts were eventually sort of accredited by the APA, IPA, but only on the condition that Lacan himself was expelled. Now, Lacan then went on, he was a kind of, he was pretty much a nomad after that. Um, he was taken in by people like Alfuser and Levi Strauss. Um, at you know, various institutions across Paris during the time. But he pretty much ended up a maverick with his own school and his own set of seminars. And it's probably at this point uh, worth saying something about his teaching practices. Uh, Lacan was not a great writer. Well, in fact, he was a great writer. But he was not a great writer. Uh, he was not somebody who devoted an enormous amount of time to writing. It was not his preferred medium. We have some two volumes of uh, edited essays uh, over his sort of, um, you know, over his, you know, the entire span of his career, really. But what he did do was hold weekly sessions, first at St. Anne's Hospital, and then when he was sort of, uh, um, sort of uh, thrown out of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the SPA, the Society for French Psychoanalysts in Paris, um, when he was thrown out of them, he started working in a philosophy department. And what this meant was that he had a very diverse group of people he was now talking to. He's not just talking to clinicians in a hospital. He's talking to philosophers and theologians. Again, we have all these crucible of ideas sort of feeding into all of it. Um, and Lacan, it's fair to say, made the seminars a very important cultural event within Paris at those times. There's some lovely clips of him at Louvain turning up and the cheers, the packed auditoriums. He was very much a performer, Lacan. And this really makes sense. Again, it comes back to the question of speech. Psychoanalysis is the talking cure. And so the best and most effective means of teaching is through talking rather than, say, writing books. Uh, and uh, these all sorts of celebrities and uh, famous philosophers would turn up to these seminars. They were great cultural events. And during this period, he really systematically worked through the entirety of Freud's canon. As I say, rewriting this on the whole of the structural linguistics. Now, if we think about Lacan's thought, his metapsychology, and how he puts this all together, there's really probably three aspects, a little bit like Freud's id, ego, and superego. Uh, Lacan comes up with his own sort of taxonomy. Uh, the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. This is his metapsychology. These are the three sort of principal blocks that orientate all psychological thinking. So if we just start with the imaginary briefly. Uh, the imaginary, uh, again, take the word at its face value. Imaginary, the image. Uh, the imaginary stands, if you will, for the area of, of wholeness. It derives from an early experiment he did uh, with a small uh, sort of, uh, well, actually it's an experiment that was done by, I think, Henry Wallen, uh, with a small six-month-old child and a chimpanzee, a small baby chimpanzee. And uh, Wallen noticed the difference between the two. If you put a small chimpanzee in front of a mirror, it very quickly loses, its, uh, loses interest in the mirror. Uh, 
But if you put a small child in front of the mirror, not only will it be fascinated by that, but it'll be fascinated for the rest of its life. Every shop window it's going to walk past, it's going to be stealing a glance of itself. And what is it about the human that makes it so absolutely, you know, uh, you know sort of fall in love with its own image? Well, part of the reasons are physiological. As humans, we're born, but we're born prematurely. We can't feed ourselves, we can't walk, we can't clothe ourselves. We rely on somebody to do it for us. We're uncoordinated in our body movements. But when we look in a mirror, the mirror responds to us exactly as we do. So in the mirror we see this promise of the unity of the human subject. Wow, I can be a whole and complete thing. And this is very important. It's this drive for completeness and wholeness that was very much driving the early interpretation of Freud. So when, Freud is, uh, when the Freudians were positing that we need to sure up the ego defences against this sort of murderous world, Lacan was saying, well, actually, you're just creating an illusion for yourself. You're just creating an illusion. Um, if you think about um, collectors, what do people do who collect? Why do we collect? Um, anybody who's bought a big volume of work will know that absolute satisfaction when you put it on the shelf and it's called complete. It's the promise of completeness. It's the imaginary identification. But of course, the one thing that you can't include in any sort of collection, whether it's whimsies, books or whatever, is yourself. So there's always something missing, which is why we can never really have this big ego bubble. And of course, if we start to underpin what it is to be human with language, well, language introduces all sorts of problems of lack into the human subject. All sorts of problems of lack. And here we move on to the second, if you will, of Freud's big sort of uh, three orders of the psyche. The symbolic, we've had the imaginary, and now this is the symbolic. And actually, in, in, a, in, a, in a strange way, these kind of... Um, charter trajectory of Lacan's teaching overall. So in his early work, he's very interested in the, in the imaginary. In his middle period, he's interested in the symbolic. And uh, as we'll get to in his latter period, he's interested in the real. So what's the symbolic? Well, the symbolic, uh, I suppose, in its simplest terms, we can just say it's language, really. But what does it mean to say it's language? Well, let's take a subject, uh, you know, let's take a subject like God. As soon as we say God exists, or I believe God exists, we introduce the possibility that God doesn't exist by, by virtue of the very assertion. And Lacan's point is that as soon as we start to talk and become, uh, a, you know, and function within language, we're not only, not only do we have the creative power to talk and be social, but language brings with it this inherent lack, the possibility of non-being its well. So we have the imaginary, which is wholeness, and we have the symbolic, which is really, as I say, language, law, but it introduces what in Freudian terms we might call castration. You know, the, it, language and law sort of puts a big bar across us. Um, you think, for example, of um, uh, the guy who goes out and buys one of those really nice sort of fancy Ferraris. He's divorced, he's got a bit of extra cash now, and uh, you know, he's sort of, uh, um, he, he goes out and it's, you know, it's the ultimate sign of male sort of potency, big red Ferrari. But of course, as soon as he gets it on the road, the first thing he has to do is press the limiter switch because the car's too fast for the road. So of course, you know, we have all these great big signs. We finally get to have the things we want. But of course, the real lesson is that ultimately we're castrated. And Lacan's point is that Whatever it is that we do and we try to accede to is always underwritten in this way by a certain lack, by something that just can't be spoken. Um, another way to put this uh, quite simply is to say that um, any kind of system, any kind of system that you bring into existence always necessarily ends up occluding its point of origin. So for example, we can see but actually, in order to see, we have the sort of fibre optics in our eyes disappearing out of the retina into the brain. And that little point at the back of the eye, 
where uh, uh, the optic fibres dis disappear, sort of reappears in our vision as a blind spot. We can see, but only on the condition that we somehow seed a portion of sight itself. So all that we end up doing in life always seems to be underwritten in some way by a sense of lack. And this becomes his big challenge to the psychoanalytic establishment. But psychoanalysis is not simply about trying to sure up our sense of self. It's not simply trying to make us function better so we can be happy and productive citizens. It's really trying to get us to understand and in some senses reconcile us with the lack that underpins what it is to be a human being. And moving on to the third order of the psyche that Lacan introduces, which really takes up his later work. He calls it the real, the real. And again, you might think of the real as, uh, you know, the sort of like the hard, inert, sort of material reality that we live in. But Lacan's point is, is almost the exact opposite. That in any field, you could say that when we come into existence, we have to give something up, like the guy who buys the Ferrari and has to put the limiter switch on. We have to give something up. And what we give up, because we've given it up as condition of being, speaking beings, sort of returns within the symbolic, but it returns as the real. It returns as a kind of absence but it's an absence that is felt nonetheless. You might think, for example, of the black hole, Stephen Hawking's uh, famous discovery. And, um, you, you know, you, because you can't actually see what a black hole is, because no light escapes. The only thing that you can see is the way that it disturbs and affects the, you know, the surrounding orbit and the surrounding planets. And that's quite a good description of, of what the corn's trying to get at, particularly in regard of this emphasis on structure. What is it about what we say, or, or rather, how does what we say become refracted or warped by these strange kinds of absences that we can never quite put our fingers on. You can imagine, for example, that, uh, I don't know, a young lady might, uh, or a young man might sort of uh, you know, smile at you and it can incite your desire.